Welcome to the first video of a series entitled The Theories of Personality. These videos will take up an introductory analysis of those approaches to personality that have had a significant impact on the field of psychology since its inception in the late 19th century. A study of personality theory allows us to think about the psychology of individuals, to address the meaning of personal existence, and explore that symbolic and historical human world emerging out of the complex interplay of biology and social influences. This series considers how forces beyond our awareness move us and how our life story is shaped and transformed out of that mysterious core of motivations. We'll reflect upon the compatibility of science and personality, increase awareness for the range of human variation, and grow in our knowledge about the various approaches and levels of analysis that go into the science of personality. Today's video addresses the following question. What are the three central pillars that shape personality? The first central pillar is nature. Nature refers to those features of our personality that are influenced by biology, beginning with evolutionary history, and the distinctly human genetic information it has given rise to. Specific environmental demands gave preferential treatment to certain traits over others in the early development of the human species. Those traits adapted for survival and reproduction were then passed down while other less adapted traits receded, sometimes being altogether lost. Some traits we share with other animals, and the more genetically similar we are to an animal species, the more we generally have in common. All living things have basic physical needs such as water and nutrients that motivate their activity. Every species has its unique ways of meeting those needs and a set of behaviors that evolve that are conducive to meet those needs within a given environment. Although not geared toward immediate survival, most animals also have some drive to reproduce. The psychological dimension of these drives in animals is often inaccessible to us. Still, we can see in the animal kingdom a vast array of behavioral rituals and forms of enticement that facilitate sexual activities. Additionally, some of the more complex animals have more elaborate social networks, sometimes operating in packs and coordinating action for the collective survival of the group. When separated from the group, some of these animals fail to thrive, displaying behaviors that might be interpreted as loneliness, anxiety, and agitation. Along with this are varying manners of raising their young. Some species are independent from the moment they're born or hatched, while others require many years of nurturance. These unique needs and drives emerging over thousands of years of evolutionary history account for a wide range of characteristic behaviors. Just as important and perhaps more interesting, at least for a personality course, are variations of these behaviors within the same species. The main driver of evolutionary history is genetic variability that allows for adaptive changes over time. At any given moment in the life of a species, that variability is on display in ways that can be subtle or highly conspicuous. Nature is not limited to genetics, but all the biological processes they give rise to, including the endocrine and nervous systems. Here is where we can more directly correlate behavior with biology by, for example, seeing how certain species have dedicated brain tissue in areas different from other species. One thing observed is that the more complex and elaborate an animal's behavior is, the larger the brain size tends to be, or at least the more densely packed the nervous tissue and connections are. Though possessing brains that are physically smaller than many other animals, birds, for example, have more nerve cells in a given area than other animals with larger brains. These observations raise some critical questions. How much of human activity can be accounted for by the evolutionary history of its species? And how can that same history account for the variability observed within that activity across individuals? Finally, how readily separable are those activities from the unique influences of culture that also seem to shape human activity and individuality? No one with any sense of what is being spoken of here will deny that humans have basic needs rooted in their biology. 
And few would also deny that there seems to be some universal drive for reproduction and forming social relationships. What is far less agreed upon is how well evolutionary principles explain how humans go about meeting those needs and satisfying those drives and how well those principles account for the variability observed. Perhaps one of the more debated examples, and certainly one that often quickly becomes polemical, concerns the influence of evolutionary history on sex differences. Few would dispute that individuals have distinct chromosomes that typically give rise to primary and secondary sexual characteristics. What is far less agreed upon is to what extent such biological differences have a role in accounting for observed behavioral differences and whether it is even possible to distinguish those influences from those coming from one's immediate environment and history of norms maintained by particular social structures. Further complicating matters is the concept of epigenetics. Even though genetics does much to shape us, Research has demonstrated how specific behavioral genes are switched on and off based on certain experiences individuals go through and that the effects of those experiences may even be passed down to offspring, leading to a set of active genes that have been shaped by a more immediate environmental influences rather than some environmental history taking place many thousands or even millions of years ago. Such considerations lead us to the second central pillar, culture. The difficulty of even speaking of nature independent of culture is that I must use words to describe nature, and language is itself a central feature of culture. Thus, even talking about biology can itself be a cultural phenomenon. So what do I mean by culture? I'm using the term rather broadly to refer to social structures including beliefs, activities, and authorities that go into a human world. Like genetics, culture is passed down across generations. But cultural memory is not explicitly embedded in biology. Culture is sustained primarily by language rather than genes, and it's language where the human-animal diverges greatly from other species. Suppose even one accepts that some animals have some rudimentary linguistic abilities. The quantitative difference is so great as to amount to a qualitative shift in understanding humans compared to other animals. Culture itself is not one single entity, but is in fact a series of nested and overlapping cultures that have become increasingly porous and perhaps even more homogenous as the world has gotten smaller through transportation and communication technologies. In thinking about culture, there's first one's family's culture, which has its own distinct set of traditions, mannerisms, and values. Then there are the cultures of one's school, work, and other local communities. These intersect with more encompassing dimensions of social life such as the economy, politics, law, and the shared attitudes, values, goals, and social practices that characterize a society. Cultural tendencies are also marked by a great deal of variability across individuals. These variations are what contribute to the ongoing evolution of culture as it continues to shift over time. Some cultures are marked by more variability among individuals than others, and some cultures undergo radical transformations while others remain fairly constant. However, a pivotal component to culture is its authority structure, which often consists of implicit rules and prohibitions designed to maintain the status quo of that society. It institutes a series of rewards and punishments that shape behavior. Without authority, cultures would fall apart. Yet such authorities may exhibit varying levels of oppressive power over different members of society to maintain those cultures. It's also the case that individuals take up various positions relative to that authority and those positions are often not consciously chosen. One individual may be particularly oppressed by an authority while another individual is raised up as an example. Some individuals are profoundly concerned with conforming to authority demands while others take on a more rebellious position. And still other individuals become defined by being expelled by that authority or perhaps expelling themselves wishing to have no part in conforming to or challenging the status quo. 
This authority structure is first communicated by one's caregivers who are themselves under the constraints of that authority and so pass on its rules and prohibitions as much as they might have passed on their genetics, assuming if the caregiver and biological parents are one and the same. So far we have spoken of two central pillars that shape personality, nature and culture. I've suggested that in humans there is a complex interplay between the two that's nearly impossible to untangle fully. Nature itself can only be communicated through culture, that is, through language, which is the genetic code of that culture. You might recognize this distinction as being akin to what in psychology is often called the nature-nurture debate. However, the way nurture is typically defined is not the same as the way I'm using culture. Nurture typically includes more immediate, localized experiences that are not reducible to culture. There remains a third central pillar of personality that I would like to call events. Events are unique singular experiences that have a profound impact on the lives of individuals. Events can be positive or negative. Though certain events are more likely in some environments than others, their occurrences are not planned or expected. In psychology, the kind of event that typically garners the most attention is what is called trauma. The loss of a loved one, an injury, illness, a natural disaster, etc. All these can be events that profoundly impact us and shape who we become. Traumas need not be the same as you might find described in the DSM, but can also be relational traumas, abandonments, breakups, neglect, etc. Such experiences, especially in early childhood, can shape personality for a lifetime. Events need not only be negative as well, they can also be positive, such as a sudden windfall, falling in love, a chance meeting with someone who goes on to have a profoundly positive impact on our lives. Sometimes we don't even realize that we're experiencing an event until well after it happens. In the early days of graduate school, I was invited to my advisor's home to meet with him and his other advisees. I knew the time and place. I even knew the names of those who would be attending. I anticipated the kinds of conversations that would take place, the banal pleasantries of small talk. Yet I couldn't foresee that what would result in that meeting was one of my most enduring and impactful friendships. Before its actualization, I couldn't imagine such a possibility nor imagine how that encounter would shape my thoughts and ambitions in the years to come. Only upon retrospection does an event sometimes appear as such. And so we have the three pillars of personality, nature, culture, and events. As we examine each theorist of personality, we'll consider how they uniquely address these three pillars within their theory, beginning with Sigmund Freud's theory of psychoanalysis. We'll use his essay entitled An Autobiographical Study to sample his ideas, which we will examine in the following video. If you wish to support this work, feel free to like and share this video, as well as subscribe to this channel. Until next time, be well.